Passengers can subject the pilot to up to nine or ten times the force of gravity so quickly that the usual experiences of graying out and tunnel vision are effectively bypassed and he will fade straight into unconsciousness. But a further sinister sting in the tale of G loss of consciousness is that if he's lucky enough to wake up at all, its effects are by no means over. When you have a loss of consciousness, basically the blood pressure in the brain goes to zero and after a few seconds it basically takes a nap. And you go through this, what we call an absolute incapacitation period of time. During this time, your mind is elsewhere. It's in a dreamlike world. You could be on the planet Mars or whatever. As the blood gets back into the brain and all those centers start working again, you start waking up and you realize that you are again a human being, that you're in an airplane. In fact, you're piloting and all of a sudden you look out in front and there are some trees in front of you and pull on a stick and you save your life. Now, in peacetime, for a military pilot, that's about all he really needs because the only real threat out there is hitting the ground. The problem is, for military aviation, is the wartime consequences of a GLC. Not only do you go through the 12 seconds of absolute incapacitation and then this 12 seconds of waking up into this dreamlike state, the problem is your higher learning centers, your cognitive skills, the skills that we as fighter pilots learn, that's flying, uh, dogfighting, and dropping bombs, they don't start working for at least two minutes, and sometimes as long as four minutes. In the air-to-air -air business, which I'm most familiar with, is it can be very serious. Because you can imagine you're flying along in a two-ship package out there, and your wingman looks over his shoulder and sees a, an attacking aircraft, so immediately calls the section or the two-ship to break, let's say in this case a right turn. So immediately you go into a hard right turn, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine G's, whatever is required, and if your attention is over your shoulder looking back trying to find the guy that's trying to kill you out there in about five or six seconds if you're not doing anything to elevate your pressure upstairs you're going to be taking a nap and what happens there then instead of pulling five six seven eight nine g's where required the aircraft eases off and now you become a one g strafe target and the guy can just go right in there and literally gun your brains out and you're going to die traditionally the inappropriately named G-suit, which is actually an inflatable corset with legs, has offered some measure of support to the pilot by squeezing his legs and stomach to prevent his blood from pooling in his feet. But even at their best, these suits only offer an extra G or so of enhanced tolerance. And in the viciously maneuverable F-16, that just isn't enough. In the face of this awesome power, and for the first time ever in fighter aviation, pilots assigned to F-16 squadrons are now required to be G-rated in the centrifuge and are taught what is known as the energy straining maneuver. Great. Subject is ready. Break. Go on. Break is activated. Pressure. Pilots and doctors alike coyly describe this exercise as exactly like straining on the toilet when you're constipated. This may be faintly embarrassing, acutely uncomfortable, and when performed on the ground at 1G, very dangerous. But in high G maneuvers, it can win an extra 3 Gs of tolerance for the pilot. Our whole purpose is to give them the confidence and the knowledge that they can operate at the higher G levels without taking a nap and maybe having a bad day. Hello. Hello. I repeat. Hello. In an effort to further Body reduce control. the stresses on the pilot, this highly Body computerized on. version of the F-16 can actually talk. Brake fuel 5.6 pounds. Advisory altitude. The principal objective, of course, is to present the pilot with auditory information, which previously had to be read from a dial or a display. But a secondary benefit relates to G-induced loss of consciousness. If the plane believes that the pilot is diving too quickly towards the ground, it will tell him so. And if he ignores the warning or can't hear it because he's unconscious, the plane will take over and fly him to safety. Although there are myriad displays and dials which tell the pilot about the status of the aircraft, until now there's been nothing to tell the aircraft about the status of the pilot. This study, being conducted by doctors at Edwards Air Force Base in California,
monitors the pilot's brain waves while he's flying so that eventually the plane will be able to judge whether the guy at the controls is awake, asleep, or somewhere in between. <coughs> and that goes right to the equipment. The key to the system is a dynamic analysis of the different types of brain waves associated with different types of activities. Hey, Captain Esserman, would you please gently grit your teeth for me? That's fine. Now relax your jaw. All right, now could you please close your eyes for us? It's these longer, more regular alpha rhythms associated with a state of relaxed vigilance which are of particular interest to the doctors running the study. For three years, test pilots have subjected themselves and their aircraft to every stressful maneuver in the book, while having their brain waves recorded for subsequent analysis back in the laboratory. The study has amassed a wealth of data which will be published this year. But already there have been some interesting and unexpected themes emerging, not just concerning the brain's experience of G's, but also concerning that other potential killer, information overload. It turns out that fighter pilots are predominantly artists because flying planes is a function of the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is the administrator, checking data, establishing priorities. From time to time, the two halves check with each other that all is going well. But problems occur when that cross-checking starts occurring too often, when the brain can't decide who's in control. Combined with the physical effects of G's, this psychological overload amounts to a serious problem for today's pilots, a problem some scientists have called the biology barrier. Perhaps even more profound in some ways than the sound barrier. We could come up with technology to resolve that problem and go far beyond it. But now we have to redesign the operator. And the decision is, do we maintain a biological operator or or a silicon-based oper operator. Or perhaps even both. Here at Wright Petter, the tiny magnetic down. fields given off by the brain activity of this research volunteer are being analyzed by a superconducting device known simply as squid. Controlling fighter aircraft systems simply by thinking is, some researchers claim, no more than 30 years away. But if technology is making such giant strides forward, why push human pilots beyond their limits? Why risk human flesh and blood in cockpits at all? If we were able to know everything that was going to go on in a battle, if we knew where the enemy was going to be, we knew where uh, our friendlies were going to be, if we knew how well our aircraft was going to work, how well our weapons were going to work, it wouldn't be necessary to put a pilot in the loop because we can program a computer or a drone to go do that work. But that's not what happens in the battle. The whole battle situation engenders a sense of uncertainty. Therefore, you have to have an element in that system that can adapt, can adjust, to be able to compensate for the deficiencies of the system or perhaps some of the gaming that the enemy does. Therefore, we believe that for a long time, we're going to have a human in the loop. Even Star Wars had a pilot in the cockpit. But air combat maneuvering is so dynamic. The human element brings flexibility that I think will actually be the key to success out there. Because there's just no substitute for being on the spot, in the air, seeing who's injured, who's not damaged, who's in trouble, who's not in trouble. Um, there's all sorts of things that the pilot can do at the scene that someone far away from the scene remotely flying it or computer controlled airplane will never ever be able to figure out. One thing is clear. We can no longer continue to ignore the intrinsic limits of human physiology and psychology. Technology has brought these highly educated, highly trained pilots face to face with what has been referred to in this program as the biology barrier. If pilots are to remain in the cockpit at all in the future, technology will have to find a way to overcome that barrier as well.